We now move to oral questions. First of all, to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And I call Michael Copeland. Mr. Copeland. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Speaker, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My department and Invest Northern Ireland have a key role to play in addressing the issue of un unemployment by ensuring that we deliver on our programme for government commitment to promote 25,000 new jobs. A significant element of Invest NI's job promotion activity is directed at helping to rebuild the local economy in the wake of the economic downturn. In doing so, the Jobs Fund has offered an important source of employment creation, particularly in providing opportunities for those who would be considered as long-term unemployed. Since its launch in 2011, the Jobs Fund has created over 4,300 new jobs. Some 300 of those jobs have been created for younger people not in education, employment or training who have received support to start up their own business. And a further 650 people resident in neighbour renewal areas have also received support to set up their own businesses. And 160 jobs have been created in social enterprises across Northern Ireland. Mr. Copeland. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for her answer. Um, however, recent Labour figures do show that over 45s in Northern Ireland are more likely to be economically inactive than they would be in the rest of the United Kingdom. What specific steps has she in mind to address that trend? Well, uh, it's long been recognised that we in Northern Ireland have an issue in relation to those who are economically inactive. It's one of the reasons why myself and the Minister for Employment and Learning are currently engaged in a consultation in relation to that very issue. Uh, in that um, consultation, uh, we will be engaging uh, with, of course, uh, stakeholders, but we hope that people will take the opportunity to look at the consultation because it gives the chance for people to come forward uh, with innovative uh, new ideas in terms of pilot projects and I know that there are some members in this House already engaged in looking at what that could mean for their own particular area, and I would encourage him to do likewise. Sammy Douglas. Mr. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I thank the Minister for her answers uh, thus far? Um, could I ask the Minister, could she inform the House um, what impact the Jobs Fund has had within my own East Belfast constituency, please? Well, the Jobs Fund has been uh, a tremendous success. Of course, it did come about uh, as one of the actions we uh, took to try and deal with the downturn uh, which came upon us. Um, it has, in East Belfast, promoted uh, a total of 1,259 uh, jobs. Uh, I think that's a tremendous uh, impact for the constituency. Um, that includes 30 job fund business investment projects of various stages of development, which should lead to the creation of uh, 1,179 new jobs uh, as well. Of course, that includes a very large project uh, known as Stream, um, which had 993 jobs. Um, but uh, I think as well we should note that it's also, the Jobs Fund is also having an impact uh, in terms of neighbourhood renewal areas and indeed in terms of uh, those not in education, employment and training. So it's not just creating new jobs but also helping people uh, in those disadvantaged areas as well. Alwyn McGuinness. Uh, Mr McGuinness. Uh, thank you Mr Speaker and I thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, clearly there's need uh, for uh, a, a specific approach in relation to the long-term unemployed. The Minister has uh, put a lot of emphasis on the uh, Jobs Fund. Of those jobs that have been created, could the Minister estimate how many of those jobs, uh, in fact, have gone to long-term unemployed people? Well, I don't have those statistics because it's not a measure uh, that uh, we have. Um, I know that um, the House would like me to have statistics broke down into many, many different categories, but I don't have uh, that particular category. But I think the Jobs Fund uh, certainly is my strongest uh, tool, if you like, to help uh, in particular areas. But it should be seen alongside everything else that has been happening uh, particularly the work that goes on uh, in Stephen Farry's department and the Employment and Learning Department, and in particular his employer subsidy um, in, in the strand of the steps to work, because I think that that subsidy does very much provide uh, an incentive to employers to recruit unemployed or economically inactive clients whom they wouldn't otherwise look to. Uh, and I think that that uh, is part of the suite that we look across government 
uh, as to how we can help those who are struggling uh, with unemployment and particularly those struggling uh, for a, a long length of time. The uh, economically inactive strategy, which as I say is out for consultation at the moment, does provide the opportunity to do something innovative uh, in this area and we look forward to hearing the consultation responses uh, which should be with us over the next month. Bottle McRae. Mr. McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier, the Minister mentioned discussions with the Minister for Employment and Learning. Uh, is she concerned about the large numbers of people that are getting ring binders full of certificates but are no nearer to getting a job because they lack the skills demanded by industry? Well, I, I think that the, I mean, I'm not here to answer on behalf of the Employment and Learning Minister. He's well capable of doing that for himself. But the one area where I am involved with him uh, in relation to what he calls ring binders full of certificates is in relation to the Software Testers Academy. And I do know uh, that those people uh, get jobs. They get real and meaningful jobs, and that's why the academy was set up to actually deal with a deficit that was there in terms uh, of skills for uh, the IT industry. So I think a targeted approach is certainly what is needed. Uh, there is no point in giving young people skills uh, if there's no jobs at the end uh, of that uh, uh, skills development. And certainly that's where my focus has been. And I think it's where the focus of the Dell Minister has been as well. And that's why he's putting a lot of emphasis at the moment in relation to uh, apprenticeships. And I uh, encourage him to do that. And I think that that's uh, the way we should be moving forward. Katrina Rana. Uh, question number two. Keshta Viradola, the Hall. I had a meeting with the Freight Transport Association uh, in 2013 on these very issues. Uh, the UK government estimates that 9 out of 10 UK registered HGV operators should experience no overall change due to reductions in vehicle excise duty. The Republic of Ireland remains our second largest market for sales after Great Britain and is a particularly important market for SMEs. I am aware that rising transport costs are a concern for many local firms. I have therefore tasked my department and the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy to conduct research on the cost of doing business. This will examine a range of cost areas, including transport costs, and seek to benchmark costs for Northern Ireland firms against the Republic of Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Katrina Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I thank the Minister for her answer and would she agree that given the impact that such a levy would have on cross-border economic development that it uh, is of a cross-cutting nature, would she encourage the Environment Minister to bring a paper to the Executive on this matter? Well, of course, this matter is not a matter for the Environment Minister, it's a matter for Westminster and uh, they have decided that they're going ahead with this levy. Uh, and in some ways I can understand why they've decided to do that because uh, for many of our uh, road hauliers they have to pay tolls, they have to pay charges but when they travel across Europe, uh, even when they travel in the Republic of Ireland they are subject to uh, road charges and tolls uh, and therefore it was felt that we needed to uh, give a level playing field to our hauliers as well and the uh, Freight Transport Association um, actually welcome the road user levy. Uh, they were concerned, I have to say, about the Irish government um, uh, in discussions with the UK government exempting the levy um, uh, for the whole of Northern Ireland road network but that has not uh, been the case and the Westminster uh, Department considers uh, Northern Ireland to be part of the scheme as well. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today, and I welcome her back from her business trip to Singapore. I'm sure we'll hear some good news later on. Mm -hmm. Does the Minister believe that it is right for the Republic of Ireland to push for Northern Ireland roads to be exempt from the levy, while Northern Ireland hauliers are paying toll charges when using roads in the Republic of Ireland? Well, I think the uh, way in which um, we have been able to deal with this matter, as I said, is a Westminster matter, uh, and they have decided to uh, exempt, uh, I think it is seven kilometres of roads in Northern Ireland that uh, goes in and out uh, along the border so that there are not difficulties in relation to uh, enforcement uh, in terms of this issue, uh, and that's in and around the A37 and uh, A3, which, as I say, we have in and out uh, of the Republic of Ireland. Um, but I do think it would be unfair uh, for our hauliers 
um, to have to pay the tolls that they do have to pay. And I know that the cost of doing business across Europe has risen, and as I say, I'm waiting uh, for that uh, report from the Northern Ireland uh, Centre for Economic Policy, and I look forward to the evidence base that it will bring to me. I do think it's unfair that they should be expected to pay tolls and then uh, people coming from the rest of Europe, including the Republic of Ireland, don't pay a charge in Northern Ireland. Uh, so I think it is the right uh, compromise and uh, I hope that uh, we will continue to keep an eye on this to make sure that our hauliers are not disadvantaged. John Dallet. I must do, Speaker, I have listened very carefully to the Minister and I am sure she would agree with me that what we want more than anything, or the hauliers want, is a unified and a coordinated approach to this. Now, the Minister will be aware that Leo Varadkar, the Minister for Transport, is meeting his counterparts in the UK at the end of uh, February. Can the Minister tell us what she is doing so that we do not end up with a, a, a situation where there is ping pong between North and South and, in fact, we have a coordinated and unified approach to a very serious problem? Well, I think there has been, and perhaps this is more a matter for uh, the Minister of Environment, who shadows, uh, or sorry, the Minister for Regional Development, who shadows uh, Leo Varadkar uh, in terms of the North South Ministerial Council on this issue. Uh, and I certainly will pass on the comments that the member has made in relation to that matter. But as I understand it, uh, the whole issue of being able to enforce was in and around that stretch of road uh, that did go in and out of the Republic of Ireland, and that's why they've de determined that that is exempt uh, from the regulations, and it is only uh, in the rest, uh, the rest of Northern Ireland that will be uh, applicable. And the Department of Transport have taken the view that uh, exclusion of those particular roads will not affect the overall cohesiveness uh, of the scheme in Northern Ireland, and I very much hope that that's the case. But it is, uh, I hear what the member is saying, but he should also reflect on the fact that the Freight Transport Association do welcome the scheme uh, here in Northern Ireland, and that's the point they made to me uh, back in March of last year. Jim Allister. Mr Allister. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the pressures being placed on our hauliers, is the Minister aware of the difficulties being created for Northern Ireland hauliers by excessive delay in the Southern authorities refunding VAT that they are entitled to on fuel purchases? And is there anything that she can do to try and expedite those matters? Well, again, I, I am aware of that issue because it has been raised with me uh, actually at a constituency level as opposed to uh, at a ministerial level. But again, it's probably more an issue for the Department of Regional Development. But I am, uh, of course, content to pass on the member's concerns to him so that he can raise it with the uh, appropriate authorities in the Republic. Mr. Brady. Mr. Brady. Question three. The price of heating oil is largely determined by international markets and daily movements, and the commodity price for kerosene is fully transparent. The Consumer Council produces a range of current and archived retail oil prices across Northern Ireland on its Oil Watch website. Additionally, the Northern Ireland Oil Federation, in partnership with the Consumer Council, launched a customer charter which provides service and price guarantees to consumers confirming the price of oil in advance of delivery. Thank you, Brady. I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, as the Minister may be aware, my colleagues on the Deddy Committee raised these concerns in December. Could the Minister indicate what response she's had from the Oil Federation in this regard? I'm not entirely sure what concerns um, have been raised. Certainly, I haven't received uh, any issues to take forward. But, I, I mean, the reality is uh, the price is transparent. Uh, we've had looks at this in the past. Uh, the Office of Fair Trading, indeed, had a look at the issue uh, back in 2011 uh, as well. And uh, really, all we can do is con continue to uh, look at the price of oil, continue to work with the Consumer Council, who, as I've indicated, keep a very close eye on this issue. And indeed, I welcome the fact that they are now working uh, more proactively and more positively uh, with uh, the oil industry here in Northern Ireland. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far? Um, could I ask the Minister, could she comment further on the need for regulation of the home heating oil market? 
Well, as I've indicated, the 2011 Office of Fair Trading uh, study considered that the Northern Ireland oil distribution sector is transparent, uh, but more importantly is competitive uh, on price as well, with retail prices cheaper than in Great Britain and indeed in the Republic of Ireland as well, and sometimes that's a point uh, that is missed when the story uh, comes to the fore. Um, it does remain very unclear if a uh, significant benefit would be achieved by regulation, but I know this much, it would place uh, a large regulatory uh, burden uh, and cost on what has been assessed as being a, a competitive oil supply and distribution sector. And let us not forget that that cost would be passed on to the consumer. So it's not a cost-free option to regulate. Regulation brings costs, and with costs, those have to be passed on to uh, the consumers, and we should remember that when we talk about regulation. Patrick uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, could the Minister just uh, advise the, the House, please, how often she would meet, or her department would meet, departmental officials would meet with the likes of uh, retailers, oil retailers, to discuss prices and their impact upon the economy and indeed their impact upon the likes of fuel poverty and related consumer matters? Well, as the members are only too well aware, fuel poverty is uh, taken forward by my colleague, uh, the Minister for Social Development, uh, and I'm sure he does keep in contact uh, with those retailers. Uh, there have been steps taken to help those in fuel poverty. Uh, particularly, I do commend the efforts in and around uh, bulk buying, which have taken place. I'm aware of very many excellent examples of credit unions, local councils, communities, all working together in oil buying schemes, uh, oil stamp saving schemes to ease the burden um, for the purchase of oil. We know um, that uh, the cost of energy, regardless of whether it's oil, gas or electricity, is a burden uh, on those in fuel poverty, uh, and therefore I do welcome the fact that these schemes have taken place and are there to help individuals. William Irwin. Yes, sir. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. My department has invested significantly in recent years to facilitate the extension of broadband networks, making use of numerous technologies including fixed line, radio and satellite. On 7 February 2014, I announced further investment of some £23.5 million from Government and BT to improve broadband choice and speed to over 45,000 premises across Northern Ireland. This work is scheduled to be completed by the end of 2015, and I will continue to work to extend broadband services where it is feasible and cost-effective to do so. I can thank the Minister for her reply. Uh, what cr criteria will BT use to determine where investment will be placed, if any? Well, of course, um, we are working again with BT, who have proven themselves to be good partners uh, in the past. Uh, the improvements that will take place will be based on engineering criteria and uh, what represents the best value uh, for money, because, of course, uh, most of this money is public money, uh, and therefore we will want to make sure that we have good value for money in terms uh, of our intervention. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister, and this is welcome news, but could I ask the Minister when does she first foresee uh, this money being rolled out on the ground, and will she give a commitment to those who will not be able to use line based technology? Will she, will she give an assurance that she will look at that and try and address that as well? But it's a good news story. Well, I thank the member for his acknowledgement that it is a good news story. I know we've been waiting on it for some time now, and indeed he has been one of the members who uh, keeps asking me uh, when it will be uh, available. So we are pleased that the scheme, uh, or the, rather the tender, has now been uh, agreed with BT. They will now be looking uh, at the many postcodes that have been submitted uh, to the department to see what engineering solutions there are available. Uh, in those particular areas and indeed uh, if they represent uh, good value for money. Uh, we are looking forward as well to the rollout of the mobile infrastructure uh, project as well. That's in relation to mobile phones and you might think, well, why is she mentioning uh, that in the context of uh, broadband? But we do know that there are many people who access their broadband now using their mobile 
uh, devices uh, and therefore we are looking at this in the round and trying to make sure that those people that can't access fixed line broadband can access it by another technology and that is something uh, that we are looking at at present. John McAllister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister outline how much of the £230 million from the UK government her department will receive and where that would be spent? Well, the, um, the, the £23.5 million uh, that we are rolling out in Northern Ireland is a mixture of money from my own department, uh, from the European Union, uh, from uh, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, and uh, from BT, and also from DARD. So there are five uh, parts to this scheme. Uh, I think uh, it's in the region of £6 million uh, that we received, although I stand to be corrected on that. I think that I'm, doing, I'm going from memory here, Mr McAllister, so hope you'll uh, forgive me if that figure is wrong. I think it's £6 million uh, from DCMS in relation to this particular pot of money. We will receive more money in relation to the mobile infrastructure project, the MIP, as I've indicated, but in terms of this particular scheme, I think it's £6 million. Sam Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Question number five. Uh, actions set out in the Northern Ireland Economic Strategy seek to rebalance the local economy by stimulating higher rates of innovation, increasing skills levels and encouraging export growth. Considerable progress has been made across all executive departments in implementing these actions. My department has promoted 19,329 jobs and secured investment of $1.04 billion in the Northern Ireland economy. In addition, Invest Northern Ireland has supported investment of $238 million by businesses in R&D since April 2011. We have also taken action uh, aimed at rebuilding the local labour market by continuing to offer support for businesses through a range of measures, including the Jobs Fund and Growth Loan Fund, and we are continuing to advance the case for devolution of corporation tax, which has the potential to help rebalance and rebuild the Northern Ireland economy faster than would otherwise be possible. Mr Gardner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her response thus far. But can I ask the, if the Minister could tell us how many uh, services formerly delivered by the civil service are now delivered by the private sector, and how many jobs have been relo relocated from the public to the private sector as a result? Well, I don't have those figures uh, in front of me today, but I'm quite happy to make contact with the Department of Finance and Personnel and try and assess the figures from uh, that particular department. Gregory Campbell. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister give us an update on the measures that were contained and outlined in the Northern Ireland Economic Pact and how progress is going there? Well, the Economic Pact, as the member will know, uh, in June of 2013, just before the G8, um, that was a document that was set about from Westminster and from ourselves. And obviously, corporation tax is a very important uh, part of that, and we await uh, the Scottish referendum uh, being dealt with before we have a, a particular answer in relation to that issue. But that doesn't mean that we haven't progressed in relation to other areas. Uh, in terms of enterprise zones, we have agreed to pilot an enterprise zone which will build, build on the role of Coleraine uh, as a digital hub, which I'm sure he's delighted about. Uh, and details of the possible proposal were sent to Her Majesty's Treasury uh, by my colleague, the Finance Minister, as a basis for discussion on the 6th of December. Um, we're currently awaiting feedback uh, in relation to that issue. Uh, in terms of access to finance, we have, of course, uh, met uh, as a joint ministerial task force to examine whether tailored support uh, is required for our banks and how support for Northern Ireland businesses can be maximised to improve access to finance. Uh, and we're meeting again in joint ministerial task force uh, remit uh, on the 26th of March. And we have also set up the Access to Finance Implementation Panel. They have commenced their meetings uh, as well with the four local banks. I'm very pleased with the calibre of people that we were able to attract uh, to that uh, panel. And of course, the Business Regulation Review has been launched, um, uh, and uh, 
the expert advisory panel, which includes Lord Curry, who is uh, the chair of the Westminster Better Regulation Executive. Uh, they have started their piece of work uh, as well. So pro the, the, the projects are uh, progressing, uh, and uh, we will, of course, keep in touch with our colleagues in Westminster to continue to pursue uh, the issue of corporation tax as well. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for her answers. Um, in terms of rebalancing the economy, would the Minister accept that this term must include addressing the historical neglect west of the ban? And can she explain how her department strives to rectify that situation? Um, obviously, we are uh, dealing with that issue, uh, in particular the way in which the west of the ban had to deal with area violence uh, in the past. Uh, and the fact that a lot of our infrastructure uh, was damaged in that particular way. And I am delighted that the licence competition for gas to the west has been uh, announced. And uh, we look forward to uh, natural gas being available uh, to the citizens and the uh, businesses in the west of the province for the very first time. Uh, we think that that will have a big impact uh, in the west of the province, particularly for those businesses who have had to endure uh, not having uh, the choice of energy provision. They will now have the choice of natural gas, and I very much welcome that and look forward to that being rolled out in the west of the province. Dolores Kelly. Ms. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Minister, you will be aware of the important role that small businesses uh, actually play in the Northern Ireland economy, and I just wonder, uh, would you, uh, I, and I'll speak to you later about this, come and visit part of my constituency to speak to some of the local businesses in terms of some of the difficulties they're facing in matching some of the skills that their particular industry needs to that uh, of education? And, uh, Minister, in particular, I wonder how often or how regular would you have that analysis between yourself and Minister Farry? And, and indeed the Minister of Education as well, and at the next subgroup of the, um, uh, the executive in relation to the economy, uh, we intend to discuss this very issue uh, around careers advice and making sure that the careers advice fits in with the economy of today and indeed uh, the economy of tomorrow, because as I <laughs> indicated uh, to Mr McRae earlier, there's little point in having a surfeit of skills if those skills don't match uh, with the workforce that we need. So very much uh, we need to join up education, uh, Dell and Detty in relation uh, to careers and skills advice, and I'm more than happy to have a conversation with her around that very issue. Stephen Agnew. Mr Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number six, please. Wind generation uh, rarely sets the price of wholesale electricity, though it does influence the prices on a continuing basis. At peak demand times, wind can often offset more expensive peaking plant. Also, if there is a lot of wind on the system, uh, remaining demand will be met by conventional generators, with the more efficient and cheaper being dispatched first. Tragic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And it has something that's come to, come to the attention of the Eddy Committee that, that when wind energy can meet the demand, the generation costs are significantly reduced. Um, so, does the Minister agree that in order to actually bring down price, we need to increase our investment in, in wind and reduce our over reliance on expensive fossil fuels such as gas? Well, as I've always said to the member, it's not uh, just about uh, wind energy, it's about uh, renewable energy uh, from all different types of technologies. And yes, at present, uh, we're probably over-reliant on wind in terms of our renewable energy source. Uh, I do hope that other sources of renewable energy uh, will come forward in the future, uh, whether that's tidal um, or indeed marine, uh, and we look forward to um, that coming onto the grid uh, as well as wind. But I, I do say to the member that I am carrying out a cost-benefit analysis. I think it's the right time to do that uh, in relation uh, to uh, the energy market. We're about halfway in terms of the strategic energy framework. Uh, and therefore, it is right that we review the cost uh, of energy uh, as a whole, and we will be doing that. In fact, I have appointed consultants to do that, uh, and that report will with, be with me by the end of the year, and then we'll have that uh, look at the strategic energy framework. Sammy Wilson. Mr. Wilson. The UK government has indicated from, since 2004 until 2012 
the increase in, wind, uh, in uh, electricity bills has gone up from 2 per cent to 8 per cent as a result of renewable energy. Today, the industry in Northern Ireland have said we are one of the least competitive places for energy in the whole of Europe. Would the Minister agree with me that if we followed the policies of the Green Party, we would be back to the dark ages, blackouts, no competitive industry and increased fuel poverty, and that really we ought to be going for uh, greater electricity from fossil, fossil fuels, which are much less expensive? Yeah. Well, I do agree with the member that we need to be very much aware of our security of supply issue, and uh, as members of this House will know, uh, in 2016, there will only be, uh, I think it's 200 megawatts um, uh, above the balance, uh, and therefore we should be concerned about that. And we will be taking action in relation to that issue uh, over the coming months, because we cannot allow ourselves to get into a position where we are at risk of blackouts. I mean, that would be the worst case scenario uh, for citizens. But particularly for industry uh, and for businesses, how could we possibly say to people that they should come and invest in Northern Ireland if we didn't have a secure uh, energy platform on which they could come forward? I hear what the member is saying about energy costs. He will know uh, that we are uh, looking uh, with the utility regulator into this whole issue. And I will say this as well. Every day that we are without the North-South interconnector costs us £7 million to the uh, consumers in Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland alone, and it costs a significant amount of money to the Republic of Ireland consumers as well. So every day that we are without the North-South interconnector is a constraint on the energy of Northern Ireland. Order, members. That includes all questions to the Minister. We now move to topical questions to the Minister. Anna Lowe is not in her place. And I call Pat Ramsey. I, I, I thank you, Speaker. C could I ask the Minister, has she had any discussions or her department officials had any discussions with the Alex Regeneration Company and my constituency regarding the economic regeneration elements of the one plan? Well, no, I haven't had any discussions, but that doesn't mean that the department hasn't had any discussions. Uh, I, know, I am, of course, aware of the One Plan, and indeed uh, we very much support uh, the overarching vision which the One Plan brings to uh, not just the city, uh, but indeed to the North West. But I'm happy uh, if the member wants me to meet uh, to consider such a request uh, as in the normal course. Pat Ramsey. <coughs> I, I thank the Minister for her response and, and, and for her cooperation and maybe teasing us out. Is the Minister aware of the U4D uh, launch last week, of the, a further launch of their campaign that's pointing very clearly uh, that the most important economic regeneration plan ever to come into the city would be the expansion of McGee, that it would certainly, in their words, lead to combating uh, one of the highest levels of unemployment in the region by the development of McGee? Well, of course, I am aware of the campaign, uh, and it's very capable spokespersons that uh, very often come on to remind uh, the executive about the issue, but as the member will be no doubt aware, this is not a matter for me, it's a matter for the Minister of Employment and Learning, and I presume that he will have been listening last week uh, to the case that has been put forward again. Can the Minister give the House an update on our recent trip to Singapore uh, with Ministers from Dublin and London? Well, I thank the member for that question because I haven't been able to sandwich that response into anywhere else on today's agenda. Um, the trade mission was the first of its type uh, insofar as it was the first joint mission between uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the Republic of Ireland and ourselves. And, uh, Invest Northern Ireland, Enterprise Ireland and UKTI worked very well uh, to put forward uh, for three ministers to come out to Singapore uh, on uh, the particular sector that they were wanting uh, to talk about, and that was the aerospace sector. Of course, we know that we have a very strong aerospace sector here uh, in Northern Ireland. We have, of course, the very big influence of Bombardier uh, in East Belfast, but as well as that, we have about 50 companies uh, involved in the supply chain in aerospace. So I was very pleased to be present at Singapore Air Show. It's probably around the third most important show globally in terms of aerospace, and it was very important that we were there to put forward our case. 
for Margaret. Can I thank the Minister for her response? And can I ask the Minister, can she indicate to the House how Invest NI, when organising uh, trade missions, work with the local councils, such as my own council in Strabane, to promote sub regions as a possible destination for foreign investors? Well, this, of course, is an issue that has come up on many occasions, and I have always said to the particular councils involved that they need to bring forward their proposition to us so that we're aware of what the offering is in the particular council areas. Of course, we have 26 councils at present. That will soon be uh, down to 11. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would ask the member to look at the newly developed app that we have uh, for each of the council areas to put on their particular uh, strengths and skills advantages uh, so that then the app can be given uh, to all potential investors and they can look uh, at that in particular. I know she will welcome with me the recent jobs announcements in Strabane in relation to O'Neill's. Uh, over 60 jobs uh, were created there with the help of the Jobs Fund, uh, a very worthwhile and a very good investment for Strabane. John Dallet. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to a different subject. Uh, the Minister, of course, is aware that her department has a, had a very proud record of uh, relationships with the credit union movement. Uh, does the Minister share my concern that day and daily we're reading stories of people being ripped off by loan sharks and indeed online companies charging outrageous rates of interest? Would the Minister consider, in a different role, re-engaging with the credit union movement to establish why millions of pounds are in savings, and in the same town lands and parishes, these loan sharks are running riot through people's pockets? Well, I'm more than happy to say to the member that I do and have always uh, recognised the role which the credit union plays in Northern Ireland. And I say in Northern Ireland because, of course, on the mainland, there really isn't the same level of presence as there is here uh, in Northern Ireland. And indeed, as he says, they are recognised, they have a reputation, uh, and therefore people trust them, and therefore they want to invest in them. Um, I'm happy to speak to him outside of the House in relation to what he has in mind, in relation to the promotion of the credit unions, but I certainly share his concerns in relation to loan sharks uh, and those companies that on the face of it look very warm and cuddly, but when you look a bit further, they're not cuddly at all. John Dallet. I, I, I thank the Minister for her, her, uh, for her answer, uh, which, as I expected, is very positive, and I encourage her to continue in that vein. Uh, the Minister did make reference to what she refers to as the mainland, and we're not full out about that. But is the Minister aware that in the mainland, the government there appointed field officers to go out into the highways and byways to educate people and to encourage them in the advantages of credit union. Would she consider a scheme similar to that here? Well, you see, I thought that's where the member was going with this. <laughs> the member will know that we have a, a much more developed credit union system here in Northern Ireland than they have uh, in uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. <laughs> and uh, that is why I think they have felt the need to appoint uh, and indeed to finance uh, what's happening there. Uh, we don't see the need for that because we have at least two very strong federations uh, who make their voices heard, and, and rightly so, and have done throughout the whole credit union reform process, which, as he will know, is still ongoing. Uh, and therefore, I don't think there's a need for field officers as such, but I am happy to talk to him uh, in relation to other issues which may fall somewhat short of that. Oliver McMullen. Mr. McMullen. Or Margaret, can, I, can, I call you? can the Minister tell me why the uh, £10 million agri-food loan scheme announced by yourself and the Finance Minister was handed back? Well, it hasn't been handed back. Um, it just couldn't be spent in that particular uh, period uh, because of the uh, legal uh, issues that had to be sorted out between uh, the banks, uh, between uh, the industry and um, between government and of course this is the first time that we've tried anything like this and uh, sometimes when you try something for the first time it takes a little while for the lawyers to get their head uh, around it. Uh, we are, um, I understand that the lawyers acting for the banks are now content uh, that the issue uh, is now with the principal poultry uh, supplier. Uh, and therefore, I am very hopeful that this matter will come to a head in the very near future. Oliver McMullen. Can, 
Can I thank the Minister for her answer? But can the Minister give me an update for, uh, for the going for growth strategy when she expects it to be brought before the Executive for consideration? Well, of course, this is a joint paper uh, between myself and the Agriculture Minister, uh, as I'm sure he's well aware. I was rather surprised to see the Agriculture Minister's comments when I was out of the country uh, last week about this issue, given that it is uh, a joint paper. Uh, it is uh, quite a comprehensive uh, paper. It is before the Executive now. I certainly am not, in quotes, holding it up, uh, which I think was the allegation that was made last week when I wasn't uh, around uh, to deal with the issue, uh, but it is before the executive and we very much hope that executive colleagues will sign up uh, for the going for growth, but of course that's in the context of money being available uh, to deal with going for growth and as we know uh, we are going to lose millions of pounds in relation to welfare reform uh, if we do not have an agreement in relation to this issue and therefore it is very difficult to see uh, where the money will come from and indeed I would welcome the Dard Minister's clarification on where the schemes are in relation to what she is putting forward, uh, some clarity in relation to where the money is going to come from uh, and we look forward to that clarification in the coming days. Question number six, Colm Eastwood is not in his place. Barry McElduff. I've got uh, a young uh, uh, I hope it's not too repetitive following on from Mr. Dallet's point, but in relation to credit union, uh, with an increasing number of bank closures in rural areas, in my own constituency, places like Dromoor and Fintna and Berra in the recent past, can the Minister and her department work closely with local credit unions perhaps to expand on the range of services that they are able to deliver in the future? Part of the um, credit union reform is certainly looking at the range uh, of powers that credit unions will have going forward. Uh, but as well as that, and I hear what the member saying about bank closures, um, and it is concerning for those of us who live rurally to have to deal with these issues. Um, but as well as that, of course, we can access um, banking services through the post office and the post office are very keen that we do that and I've had some discussions with them in relation to the fact that they can take deposits from most uh, of the major banks uh, and deal with uh, issues surrounding that as well. So credit unions, uh, post offices and we'll look at anything else that can help uh, in the circumstances with rural dwellers. Maureen Michael Duff. Okay. Can I ask the Minister if she has any thinking on the type of additional services that might be delivered through credit unions in the future and also does her department have a regular liaison arrangement with credit union leaders to discuss issues of common concern? Well of course uh, it's not that long ago that we not only registered credit unions but we also regulated uh, credit unions so we did have a very close relationship with the credit unions. We no longer regulate uh, the credit unions at this point as you will recall. Um, that now is carried out uh, through Westminster. Uh, we just register the credit unions now, but we still have a very good working relationship because of the historical working relationship uh, with the credit unions and indeed uh, with the uh, Ulster Federation and the Irish Federation uh, as well. In terms of uh, extra powers, I think we were looking uh, in the remit of them being able to deal with some benefits that come forward from government, uh, but I'm quite happy to clarify that to the member uh, in writing, but certainly there are particular powers that we are looking at bringing down to the credit unions. Robin Swan. Mr Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, following on from earlier answers, does the Minister still believe that the 40% target for re renewable energy that's set in the programme for government is still realistic and achievable? Well, I do, uh, because uh, at present, uh, we last year, I think, hit 17% uh, in terms of renewable energies. I think the biggest challenge for us in terms of renewable energy is in terms of the grid and uh, we have had a stronger uptake in terms of small uh, renewable projects and that has therefore put a strain on the grid uh, more so than the larger uh, energy, renewable energy projects. So uh, we do have a challenge in terms of our grid. Uh, we are looking at that proactively at present. 
the regulator has allowed NIE to uh, invest in the grid, maybe not as much as NIE would have liked to have. Uh, but we are also looking at some European funding, uh, which would have to be matched fund uh, by the industry here to see uh, if that's available to us as well to help strengthen the grid, uh, particularly in the west of the province, I have to say. Robin Schwab. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Speaker. Was the Minister then surprised when the former Minister for the Environment and the former Finance Minister called the same target impossible, impossible and economically destructive? No, I wasn't surprised at all. <laughs> <laughs> Order, members, that concludes question time. We now. Anna Lowe. Mr Speaker, I would like to very much uh, apologise for my absence today to yourself and the House. I have been very busy today dealing with a number of issues and it has just gone out of my mind, so I am very sorry. I acknowledge very much the Member coming to the House and apologising to the House.